from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Snow by Sir Hugh Walpole The second Mrs. Ryder was a young woman, not easily frightened, but now she stood in the dusk of the passage, leaning back against the wall, her hand on her heart, looking at the grey-faced window beyond which the snow was really falling against the lamplight. The passage where she was led from the studio to the dining room, and the window looked out onto the little paved path that ran at the edge of the cathedral green. As she stared down the passage, she couldn't be sure whether the woman was there or no. How absurd of her! She knew the woman was not there, but if the woman was not, how was it that she could discern so clearly the old-fashioned gray cloak, the untidy gray hair, and the sharp outline of the pale cheek and pointed chin? Yes, and more than that, the long sweep of the gray dress falling in folds to the ground, the flash of a gold ring on the white hand. No, 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 this was madness. There was no one and nothing there. Hallucination. Very faintly a voice seemed to come to her. I warned you, this is for the last time. The nonsense. How far now was her imagination to carry her? Tiny sounds about the house. The running of a tap somewhere, a faint voice from the kitchen, these and something more had translated themselves into an imagined voice. The last time. But her terror was real. She was not normally frightened by anything. She was young and healthy and bold, fond of sport, hunting, shooting, taking any risk. Now she was truly stiffened with terror. She could not move could not advance down the passage as she wanted to, and find light, warmth, safety in the dining room. All the time the snow fell steadily, stealthily, with its own secret purpose, maliciously, beyond the wind and the pale glow of the lamplight. Then unexpectedly there was noise from the hall, opening of doors, a rush of feet, a pause, and then in clear beautiful voices the well-known strains of good King Wenceslas. It was a cathedral choir, boys on the regular Christmas round. This was Christmas Eve. They always came just at this hour on Christmas Eve. With an intense, almost incredible relief, she turned back into the hall. At the same moment, her husband came out of the study. They stood together smiling at the little group of muffled, becoated boys who were singing heart and soul in the job so that the old house simply rang with their melody. Reassured by the warmth and human company, she lost her terror. It had been her imagination. Of late, she had been none too well. That was why she had been so irritable. Old Dr. Bernard was no good. He didn't understand her case at all. After Christmas, she would go to London and have the very best advice. Had she been well, she could not, half an hour ago, have shown such miserable temper over nothing. She knew that it was over nothing, and yet that knowledge did not make it any easier for her to restrain herself. After every bout of temper, she told herself that there should never be another, and then Herbert said something irritating, one of his silly muddle-headed stupidities, and she was off again. She could see now, as she stood beside him at the bottom of the staircase, that he was still feeling it. She had certainly half an hour ago said something abominably rude, personal things, things that she had not at all meant, and he had taken them in his meek, quiet way. Were he not so meek and quiet, did he only pay her back in her own coin? She would never lose her temper, of that she was sure. But who wouldn't be irritated by that meekness 
and by the only reproachful thing that he ever said to her. Eleanor, understood me better, my dear. To throw the first wife up against the second? Wasn't that the most tactless thing that a man could possibly do? And Eleanor, that worn elderly woman, the very opposite of her own gay, bright, amusing self, that was why Herbert had loved her, because she was gay and bright and young. It was true that Eleanor had been devoted. They had, she had been so utterly wrapped up in Herbert that she lived only for him. People were always recalling her devotion, which was sufficiently rude and tactless of them. Well, she could not give anyone that kind of old-fashioned sugary devotion. It wasn't in her, and Herbert knew it by this time. Nevertheless, she loved Herbert, in her own way, as he must know, know it so well that he ought to pay no attention to the burst of temper. She wasn't well. She was yet doctor in London. The little boys finished their carols, were properly rewarded, and tumbled like feathery birds out into the snow again. They went into the study, the two of them, and stood beside the big open log fire. She put her hand up and stroked his thin, beautiful cheek. I'm so sorry to have been cross just now, Bertie. I didn't mean half a I said, you know, but he didn't, as he usually did, kiss her and tell her that it didn't matter. Looking straight in front of him, he answered, Well, Alice, I do wish you wouldn't. It hurts horribly. It upsets me more than you think, and it's growing on you. You make me miserable. I don't know what to do about it, and it's all about nothing. Irritated at not receiving the usual commendation for his sweetness and making it up again, she withdrew a little answer. Oh, all right. I've said I'm sorry. I can't do any more. But tell me, he insisted. I want to know. What makes you so angry so suddenly and about nothing at all? She was about to let her anger rise, her anger at his obtuseness, obstinacy, when some fear checked her, a strange, unanalyzed fear, as though someone had whispered to her, Look out. This is the last time. It's not altogether my own fault, she answered, and left the room. She stood in the cold hall, wondering where to go. She could feel the snow falling outside the house and shivered. She hated the snow. She hated the winter. This beastly, cold, dark English winter that went on and on, only to last to change into a damp, soggy English spring. It had been snowing all day. In Polchester, it was unusual to have so heavy a snowfall. This was the hardest winter they had known for many years. When she urged Herbert to winter abroad, which he could quite easily do, he answered her impatiently, and he had the strongest affection for this pokey, dead-and-alive cathedral town. The cathedral seemed to be precious to him. He was unhappy if he didn't go and see it every day. She wouldn't wonder if he didn't think more of the cathedral than he did of herself. Eleanor had been the same. She had even written a little book about the cathedral, about the black bishop's tomb and the stained glass and the rest. What was the cathedral after all? Only a building. She was standing in the drawing room, looking out over the dusky, ghostly snow to the great hulk of the cathedral that Herbert said was like a flying ship, but to herself was more like a crouching beast, licking its lips over the miserable sinners that it was forever devouring. As she looked and shivered, feeling that in spite of herself her temper and misery were rising so that they threatened to choke her. It seemed to her that her bright and cheerful firelit drawing room was suddenly open to the snow. It was exactly as though cracks had appeared everywhere, in the ceiling, the walls, the windows, and that through these cracks the snow was filtering, dribbling in little tracks of wet down the walls, already perhaps making pools of water on the carpet. This was, of course, imagination. But it was a fact that the room was most dreadfully cold, although a great fire was burning and it was the coziest room in the house. Then turning, she saw the figure standing by the door. This time there could be no mistake. It was a gray shadow, and yet a shadow with form and outline. The untidy gray hair, the pale face like a moonlit leaf, the long gray clothes, and something obstinate, vindictive, terribly menacing in its pose. She moved and the figure was gone. There was nothing there, and the room was warm again. Quite hot, in fact. But young Mrs. Ryder, 
who had never feared anything in all her life save the vanishing of her youth, was trembling so that she had to sit down, and even then her trembling did not cease. Her hand shook on the arm of the chair. She had created this thing out of her imagination, of Eleanor's hatred of her, and her own hatred of Eleanor. It was true that they had never met, but who knew but that the spiritualists were right, and Eleanor's spirit, jealous of Herbert's love for her, had been there driving them apart, forcing her to lose her temper, and then hating her for losing it. Such things might be, but she had not much time for speculation. She was preoccupied with her fear. It was a definite, positive fear, the kind of fear that one has just before one goes under an operation. Someone or something was threatening her. She clung to her chair as though to leave it were to plunge into disaster. She looked around her everywhere. All the familiar things, the pictures, the books, the little tables, the piano were different now. Isolated, strange, hostile, as though they had been won over by some enemy power. She longed for Herbert to come and protect her. She felt most kindly to him. She would never lose her temper with him again. And at that same moment, some cold voice seemed to whisper in her ear, You had better not. It will be for the last time. At length she found courage to rise, cross the room, and go up to dress for dinner. In her bedroom, courage came to her once more. It was certainly very cold, and the snow, as she could see when she looked between the curtains, was falling more heavily than ever. But she had a warm bath, sat in front of her fire, and was sensible again. For many months, this odd sense that she was watched and accompanied by someone hostile to her had been growing. It was the stronger, perhaps, because of the things that Herbert told her about Eleanor. She was the kind of woman, he said, who once she loved anyone would never relinquish her grasp. She was utterly faithful. He implied that her tenacious fidelity had been at times a little difficult. She always said, he added once, that she would watch over me until I rejoined her in the next world. Poor Eleanor, he sighed. She had a fine religious faith, stronger than mine, I fear. It was always after one of her tantrums that young Mrs. Ryder had been most conscious of this hallucination, this dreadful discomfort of feeling that someone was near you who hated you. But it was only during the last week that she began to fancy that she actually saw anyone, and with every day her sense of this figure had grown stronger. It was, of course, only nerves, but it was one of those nervous afflictions that became tiresome indeed if you did not rid yourself of it. Mrs. Ryder, secure now in the warmth and intimacy of her bedroom, determined that henceforth everything should be sweetness and light, no more tempers. Those were the things that did her harm. Even though Herbert were a little trying, was not that the case with every husband in the world? And was it not Christmas time? Peace and goodwill to men. Peace and goodwill to Herbert. They sat down opposite to one another in the pretty little dining room hung with Chinese woodcuts, the table gleaming and the amber curtains richly dark in the firelight. But Herbert was not himself. He was still brooding, she supposed, over their quarrel of the afternoon. Weren't men children, incredible the children that they were. So when the maid was out of the room, she went over to him, bent down and kissed his forehead. Darling, you're still cross. I can see you are. You mustn't be. Really, you mustn't. It's Christmas time. And if I forgive you, you must forgive me. You forgive me? He asked, looking at her in his most aggravating way. What have you to forgive me for? Well, that was really too much. When she had taken all the steps, humbled her pride. She went back to her seat, but for a while could not answer him because the maid was there. When they were alone again, she said, summoning all her patience, Bertie, dear, do you really think that there's anything to be gained by sulking like this? It isn't worthy of you. It isn't really. He answered her quietly. Sulking? No, that's not the right word. But I've got to keep quiet. If I don't, I shall say something I'm sorry for. Then after a pause in a low voice as though to himself, These constant rows are awful. Her temper was rising again. Another self that had nothing to do with her real self a stranger to her, and yet a very old familiar friend. Don't be so self-righteous, she answered, her voice trembling a little. These quarrels 
are entirely my own fault, aren't they? Eleanor and I never quarreled, he said so softly that she scarcely heard him. No, because Eleanor thought you were perfect. She adored you. You've often told me. I don't think you're perfect. I'm not perfect either. But we've both got faults. I'm not the only one to blame. We'd better separate, he said, suddenly looking up. We don't get on now. We used to. I don't know what's changed everything, but as things are, we'd better separate. She looked at him and knew that she loved him more than ever. But because she loved him so much, she wanted to hurt him. And because he had said that he thought he could get on without her, she was so angry that she forgot all caution. Her love and her anger helped one another. The more angry she became, the more she loved him. I know why you want to separate, she said. It's because you're in love with someone else. How funny, something inside her said. You didn't mean a word of this. You've treated me as you have, and then you leave me? I'm not in love with anyone else, he answered her steadily, and you know it. But we are so unhappy together that it's silly to go on. Silly. The whole thing has failed. There was so much unhappiness, so much bitterness in his voice, that she realized that at last she had truly gone too far. She had lost him. She had not meant this. She was frightened, and her fear made her so angry that she went across to him. Very well, then. I'll tell everyone what you've been, how you've treated me. Not another scene, he answered wearily. I can't stand any more. Let's wait. Tomorrow is Christmas Day. He was so unhappy that her anger with herself maddened her. She couldn't bear his sad, hopeless disappointments with herself, their life together, everything. In a fury of blind temper, she struck him. It was as though she were striking herself. He got up and without a word left the room. There was a pause, and then she heard the hall door close. He had left the house. She stood there, slowly coming to her control again. When she lost her temper, it was as though she sank under water. When it was all over, she came once more to the surface of life, wondering where she'd been and what she had been doing. Now she stood there bewildered, and then at once she was aware of two things. One that the room was bitterly cold, and the other that someone was in the room with her. This time, she did not need to look around. She did not turn at all, but only stared straight at the curtain windows, seeing them very carefully as though she were summoning them up for some future analysis, with their thick amber folds, gold rod white lines, and beyond them the snow was falling. She did not need to turn, but with a shiver of terror she was aware that the great figure who had all these last weeks been approaching ever more closely was almost at her elbow. She heard quite clearly, I warned you, that was the last time. At the same moment, Onslow the butler came in. Onslow was broad, fat, and rubicund, a good, faithful butler with a passion for church music. He was a bachelor, and it was said, disappointed of women. He had an old mother in Liverpool to whom he was greatly attached. In a flash of consciousness, she thought of all these things when he came in. She expected him also to see the grave figure at her side, but he was undisturbed. His ceremonial complacency clothed him securely. Mr. Fairfax has gone out, she said firmly. Oh, surely he must see something, feel something? Yes, madam. Then smiling rather grandly, it's snowing hard. Never seen it harder here. Shall I build up the fire in the drawing room, madam? No, thank you. But Mr. Fairfax study. Yes, madam. I only thought that as this afternoon was so warm, you might find it chilly in the drawing room. This room warm, when she was shivering from head to foot, but holding herself lest he should see. She longed to keep him there, to implore him to remain. But in a moment he was gone, softly closed the door behind him. Then a mad longing for flight seized her, and she could not move. She was rooted there to the floor, and even as wildly trying to cry, to scream, to shriek the house down, she found that only a little whisper would come. She felt the cold touch of a hand on hers. She did not turn her head. Her whole personality, all her past life, 
her poor little courage, her miserable fortitude, were summoned to meet this sense of approaching death which was as unmistakable as a certain smell or the familiar ringing of a gong. She had dreamt in nightmares of approaching death, and it had always been like this. A fearful constriction of the heart, a paralysis of the limbs, a choking sense of disaster like an anesthetic. You were warned, something said to her again. She knew that if she turned she would see Eleanor's face, set, white, remorseless. The woman had always hated her, been vilely jealous of her, protecting her wretched Herbert. A certain vindictiveness seemed to release her. She found that she could move, her limbs were free. She passed through the door, ran down the passage into the hall. Where would she be safe? She thought of the cathedral, where tonight there was a carol service. She opened the hall door, and just as she was, meeting the thick, involving, muffling snow, she ran out. She started across the greens toward the cathedral door. Her thin black slippers sank in the snow. Snow was everywhere, in her hair, her eyes, her nostrils, her mouth, on her bare neck, between her breasts. Help! 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 She wanted to cry. But the snow choked her. Lights whirled about her. The cathedral rose like a huge black eagle and flew towards her. She fell forward, and even as she fell, a hand far colder than the snow caught her neck. She lay struggling in the snow, and as she struggled, the two hands of an icy, fleshless chill closed about her throat. Her last knowledge was of the hard outline of a ring pressing into her neck. Then she lay still, her face in the snow, and the flakes eagerly, savagely, covered her. Smee by A. M. Barrage No, said Jackson with a deprecatory smile. I'm sorry, I don't want to upset your game. I shan't be doing that because you have plenty without me. But I'm not playing any games of hide-and-seek. It was Christmas Eve and we were a party of fourteen with just the proper leavening of youth. We had dined well, it was a season for childish games, and we were all in the mood for playing them, all that is except Jackson. When somebody suggested hide-and-seek, there was rapturous and almost unanimous approval. He was the one dissonant voice. It was not like Jackson to spoil sport or refuse to do as others wanted. Somebody asked him if he was feeling seedy. No, he answered. I feel perfectly fit, thanks, but... He added with a smile which softened without retracting the flat refusal, I'm not playing hide-and-seek. One of us asked him why not. He hesitated for some seconds before replying. I sometimes go and stay at a house where a girl was killed through playing hide-and-seek in the dark. She didn't know the house very well. There was a servant staircase with a door to it. When she was pursued, she opened the door and jumped into what she must have thought was one of the bedrooms, and she broke her neck at the bottom of the stairs. We all looked concerned, and Mrs. Fernley said, How awful! And you were there when it happened? Jackson shook his head very gravely. No, he said, but I was there when something else happened, something worse. I shouldn't have thought anything could be worse. This was, said Jackson, and shudder visibly, or so it seemed to me. I think he wanted to tell the story and was angling for encouragement. A few requests, which may have seemed to him lack urgency, he affected to ignore, and went off at a tangent. I wonder if any of you have played a game called Smee. It's a great improvement on the ordinary game of hide-and-seek. The name derives from the ungrammatical colloquialism, It's Me. You might care to play if you're going to play a game of that sort. Let me tell you the rules. Every player is presented with a sheet of paper. All the sheets are blank except one, on which is written Smee. Nobody knows who is Smee except Smee himself, or herself as the case may be. The lights are then turned off, and Smee slips from the room and goes off to hide. And after an interval, the other players go off in search, without knowing whom they are actually in search of. One player, meeting another, challenges with the word Smee, and the other player, if not the one concerned, answers Smee. The real Smee makes no answer when challenged, and the second player remains quietly by him. Presently they will be discovered by a third player, who having challenged and received no answer will link up with the first two. This goes on until all the players have formed a chain, 
and the last to join is marked down for forfeit. It's a good noisy romping game and in a big house it often takes a long time to complete the chain. You might care to try it and I'll pay my forfeit and smoke one of Tim's excellent cigars here by the fire until you get tired of it. I remarked that it sounded a good game and I asked Jackson if he had played it himself. Yes, he answered. I played it in the house I was telling you about. And she was there? The girl who broke... No, no, Mrs. Fernley interrupted. He told us he wasn't there when it happened. Jackson considered. I don't know if she was there or not. I'm afraid she was. I know that there were thirteen of us, and there ought only to have been twelve. And I'll swear that I didn't know her name, or I think I should have gone clean off my head when I heard that whisper in the dark. No, you don't catch me playing that game, or any other like it, any more. It spoiled my nerve quite a while, and I can't afford to take long holidays. Besides, it saves a lot of trouble and inconvenience to own up at once to being a coward. Tim Voos, the best of hosts, smiled around at us, and in that smile there was a meaning which is sometimes vulgarly expressed by the slow closing of an eye. There's a story coming, he announced. There's certainly a story of sorts, said Jackson, but whether it's coming or not, he paused and shrugged his shoulders. Well, you're going to pay a forfeit instead of playing? Please, but have a heart and let me down lightly. It's not just a sheer cussedness on my part. Payment in advance, said Tim, ensures honesty and promotes good feeling. You're therefore sentenced to tell the story here and now. And here follows Jackson's story unrevised by me and passed on without comment to a wider public. Some of you know, I know, have run across the Sangstons. Christopher Sangston and his wife, I mean. They're distant connections of mine. At least Violet Sangston is. About eight years ago, they bought a house between the North and South Downs on the Surrey and Sussex border. And five years ago, they invited me to come and spend Christmas with them. It was a fairly old house. I couldn't say exactly of what period, and it certainly deserved the epithet rambling. It wasn't a particularly big house, but the original architect, whoever he may have been, had not concerned himself with economizing in space. And at first, you could get lost in it quite easily. Well, I went down for the Christmas, assured by Violet's letter, that I knew most of my fellow guests, and that the two or three who might be strangers to me were all lambs. Unfortunately, I am one of the world's workers, and I couldn't get away until Christmas Eve, although the other members of the party had assembled on the preceding day. Even then, I had to cut it rather fine to be there for dinner on my first night. They were all dressing when I arrived, and I had to go straight to my room and waste no time. I may even have been keeping dinner waiting a bit, but I was last to go down, and it was announced within a minute of my entering the drawing room. There was just time to say hello to everybody I knew, to be briefly introduced to the two or three I didn't know, and then I had to give my arm to Mrs. Gorman. I mention this as the reason why I didn't catch the name of a tall, dark, handsome girl I hadn't met before. Everything was rather hurried, and I'm always bad at catching people's names. She looked cold and clever and rather forbidding, the sort of girl who gives the impression of knowing all about men, and the more she knows of them, the less she likes them. I felt that I wasn't going to hit it off with this particular lamb of violets, but she looked interesting all the same, and I wondered who she was. I didn't ask, because I was pretty sure of hearing somebody address her by name before very long. Unluckily, though I was a long way off her at table, and as Mrs. Gorman was at the top of her form that night, I soon forgot to worry about who she might be. Mrs. Gorman is one of the most amusing women I know, an outrageous but quite innocent flirt, with a very sprightly wit which isn't always unkind. She can think half a dozen moves ahead in conversation, just as an expert can in a game of chess. We were soon sparring, or rather, I was covering against the ropes, and I quite forgot to ask her in an undertone the name of the cold, proud beauty. The lady on the other side of me was a stranger, or had been until a few minutes since, and I didn't think of seeking information in that quarter. There was a round dozen of us, including the Sangstons themselves, and we were all young or trying to be. The Sangstons themselves were the oldest members of the party, and their son Reggie, in his last year at Marlborough, must have been the youngest. When there was talk of playing games after dinner, it was he who suggested me. 
he told us how to play it just as I've described it to you. His father chipped in as soon as we all understood what was going to be required of us. If there are any games of that sort going on in the house, he said, for goodness sake be careful of the back stairs on the first floor landing. There's a door to them, and I've often meant to take it down. In the dark, anybody who doesn't know the house very well might think they are walking into a room. A girl actually did break her neck on those stairs about ten years ago when the Ainsties lived here. I asked how it happened. Oh, said Sangston. There was a party here one Christmas time, and they were playing hide-and-seek, as you proposed doing. This girl was one of the hiders. She heard somebody coming, ran along the passage to get away, and opened the door of what she thought was a bedroom, evidently with the intention of hiding behind it while her pursuer went past. Unfortunately, it was a door leading to the back stairs, and that staircase is as straight and almost as steep as the shaft of a pit. She was dead when they picked her up. We all promised for our own sakes to be careful. Mrs. Gorman said that she was sure nothing could happen to her, since she was insured by three different farms, and her next of kin was a brother whose consistent ill luck was a byword in the family. You see, none of us had known the unfortunate girl. As the tragedy was ten years old, there was no need to pull long faces about it. Well, we started the game almost immediately after dinner. The men allowed themselves only five minutes before joining the ladies, and then young Reggie Sangston went round and assured himself that the lights were out all over the house, except in the servants' quarters and in the drawing room, where we were assembled. We then got busy with twelve sheets of paper, which he twisted into pellets, and shook up between his hands before passing them round. Eleven of them were blank, and Smee was written on the twelfth. The person drawing the latter was the one who had to hide. I looked and saw that mine was a blank. A moment later, out went the electric lights, and in the darkness, I heard somebody get up and creep to the door. After a minute or so, somebody gave a signal, and we made a rush for the door. I, for one, hadn't the least idea which of the party was me. For five or ten minutes, we were all rushing up and down passages, and in and out of rooms challenging one another and answering, Smee! Smee! After a bit of the alarms and excursions died down, and I guessed that Smee was found. Eventually I found a chain of people all sitting still and holding their breath on some narrow stairs leading up to a row of attics. I hastily joined it, having challenged and been answered with silence, and presently two more stragglers arrived, each racing the other to avoid being lost. Sangston was one of them. Indeed, it was he who had marked down for a forfeit, and after a little while, he remarked in an undertone, I think we're all here now, aren't we? He struck a match, looked up the shaft of the staircase, and began to count. It wasn't hard, although we just about filled the staircase, for we were sitting each a step or two above the next, and all our heads were visible. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, he concluded, and then laughed. That's it all. That's one too many. The match had burned out, and he struck another and began to count. He got as far as twelve, and then uttered an exclamation. There are thirteen people here, exclaimed. I haven't counted myself yet. Oh, nonsense, I laughed. You probably began with yourself, and now you want to count yourself twice. Out came his son's electric torch, giving a brighter and steadier light, and we all began to count. Of course, we numbered twelve. Sangston laughed. Well, he said, I could have sworn I counted thirteen twice. From halfway up the stairs came by Sangston's voice with a little nervous trill in it. I thought there was somebody sitting two steps above me. Have you moved up, Captain Ransom? Ransom said that he hadn't. He also said he thought there was somebody sitting between Violet and himself. Just for a moment there was an uncomfortable something in the air, a little cold ripple which touched us all. For that little moment it seemed to all of us, I think, that something odd and unpleasant had happened and was liable to happen again. And we laughed at ourselves and at one another and were comfortable once more. There were only twelve of us, and there could only have been twelve of us, and there was no argument about it. Still laughing, we trooped back to the drawing room to begin again. This time I was me, and Violet Sangston ran me to earth while I was still looking for a hiding place. That round didn't last long, and we were a chain of twelve within two or three minutes. Afterwards, there was a short interval. Violet wanted a wrap fetched for her, and her husband went up to get it from her room. He was no sooner gone than Reggie 
pulled me by the sleeve. I saw he was looking pale and sick. Quick, he whispered, while father's out of the way. Take me into the smoke room and give me a brandy or whiskey or something. Outside the room I asked him what was the matter, but he didn't answer at first and I thought it better to dose him and then question him afterward. So I mixed him a pretty dark complexion brandy and soda, which he drank at a gulp and then began to puff as if he had been running. I've had rather a turn, he said to me with a sheepish grin. What's the matter? I don't know. You were Smee just now, weren't you? Well, of course, I didn't know who Smee was. And while Mother and the others ran into the West Wing and found you, I turned east. There's a deep closed cupboard in my bedroom. I'd marked it down as a good place to hide when it was my turn, and I had an idea that Smee might be there. I opened the door in the dark, felt round and touched somebody's hand. Smee, I whispered, and not getting any answered, I thought I had found Smee. Well, I don't know how it was, but an odd creepy feeling came over me. I can't describe it, but I felt that something was wrong. So I turned on my electric torch and there was nobody there. Now, I swear, I touched the hand and I was filling up the doorway of the cupboard at that time, so nobody could get out and past me. He puffed again. What do you make of it? He asked. You imagine that you had touched a hand? I answered naturally enough. He uttered a short laugh. Of course. I knew you were going to say that, he said. I must have imagined it, mustn't I? He paused and swallowed. I mean, it couldn't have been anything else but imagination, could it? I assured him that it couldn't, meaning what I had said. And he accepted this, but rather with a philosophy of one who knows. He is right, but doesn't expect to be believed. We returned together to the drawing room, but by that time, they were all waiting for us and ready to start again. It may have been my imagination, although I'm almost sure it wasn't, but it seemed to me that all enthusiasm for the game had suddenly melted like a white frost in strong sunlight. If anybody had suggested another game, I'm sure we should all have been grateful and abandoned. It's me. Only nobody did. Nobody seemed to like to. I, for one, and I can speak for some of the others, too, was oppressed with the feeling that there was something wrong. I couldn't have said what I thought was wrong. Indeed, I didn't think about it at all. But somehow all the sparkle had got out of the fun, and hovering over my mind like a shadow was the warning of some sixth sense which told me that there was an influence in the house which was neither sane, sound, nor healthy. Why did I feel like that? Because Sangston had counted thirteen of us instead of twelve, and his son had thought he had touched somebody in an empty cupboard. No, there was more in it than just that. One would have laughed at such things in the ordinary way, and it was just that feeling of something being wrong which stopped me from laughing. Well, we started again, and when we went in pursuit of the unknown Smee, we were as noisy as ever, but it seemed to me that most of us were acting. Frankly, for no reason other than the one I've given you, we'd stopped enjoying the game. I had an instinct to hunt with the main pack, but after a few minutes, during which no Smee had been found, my instinct to play winning games and be first if possible set me searching on my own account, and on the first floor of the west wing, following the wall which was actually the shell of the house, I blundered against a pair of human knees. I put out my hand and touched a soft, heavy curtain. Then I knew where I was. There was a tall, deeply recessed windows with seats along the landing and curtains over the recesses to the ground. Somebody was sitting in a corner of this window seat behind the curtain. Aha, I had caught me. So I drew the curtain aside, stepped in, and touched the bare arm of a woman. It was a dark night outside, and moreover the window was not only curtain, but a blind hung down to where the bottom panes joined up with a frame. Between the curtain and the window it was as dark as the plague of Egypt. I could not have seen my hand held six inches before my face, much less the woman sitting in the corner. Smee? I whispered. I had no answer. Smee, when challenged, does not answer. So I sat down beside her, first in the field to wait the others. Then, having settled myself, I leaned over to her and whispered, Who is it? What's your name, Smee? And out of the darkness beside me the whisper came back, Brenda Ford. I didn't know the name, but because I didn't know it, I guessed at once who she was. The tall, pale, dark girl was the only person in the house I didn't know by name. Ergo, 
My companion was the tall, pale girl. It seemed rather intriguing to be there with her, shut in between a heavy curtain and a window, and I rather wondered whether she was enjoying the game we were all playing. Somehow she hadn't seemed to me to be one of the romping sort. I muttered one or two commonplace questions to her and had no answer. Smee is a game of silence. Smee and the person or persons who have found Smee are supposed to be quiet to make it hard for the others. But there was nobody else about, and it occurred to me that she was playing the game a little too much to the letter. I spoke again and got no answer, and then I began to be annoyed. She was of that cold superior type which affects the despised men. She didn't like me, and she was sheltering behind the rules of a game for children to be discourteous. Well, if she didn't like sitting there with me, I certainly didn't want to be sitting there with her. I half turned from her and began to hope that we should both be discovered without much more delay. Having discovered that I didn't like being there alone with her, it was queer how soon I found myself hating it, and that for a reason very different from the one which had at first whetted my annoyance. The girl I had met for the first time before dinner, and seen diagonally across the table had a sort of cold charm about her, which had attracted while it had half angered me. For the girl who was with me, imprisoned in the opaque darkness between the curtain and the window, I felt no attraction at all. It was so very much the reverse that I should have wondered at myself if, after the first shock of the discovery, that she had suddenly become repellent to me. I had no room in my mind for anything besides the consciousness that her close presence was an increasing horror to me. It came upon me just as quickly as I have uttered the words. My flesh suddenly shrank from her as you see a strip of gelatin shrink and wither before the heat of a fire. That feeling of something being wrong had come back to me, but multiplied to an extent which turned foreboding into actual terror. I firmly believed that I should have got up and run if I had not felt that at my first movement she would have divined my intention and compelled me to stay, by some means of which I could not bear to think. The memory of having touched her bare arm made me wince and draw in my lips. I prayed that somebody else would soon come along. My prayer was answered. Light footfalls sounded on the landing. Somebody on the other side of the curtain brushed against my knees. The curtain was drawn aside and a woman's hand, fumbling in the darkness, presented on my shoulder. Smee, whispered a voice which I instantly recognized as Mrs. Gorman's. Of course she received no answer. She came and settled down beside me with a rustle, and I can't describe the sense of relief she brought me. It's Tony, isn't it? she whispered. Yes, I whispered back. You're not Smee, are you? No, she's on my other side. She reached a hand across me, and I heard one of her nails scratch the surface of a woman's silk gown. Hello, Smee. How are you? Who are you? Oh, is it against the rules to talk? Never mind, Tony. We'll break the rules. Do you know, Tony, this game is beginning to irk me a little. I hope they're not going to run it to death by playing it all the evening. I'd like to play some game where we can all be together in the same room with a nice bright fire. Same here, I agreed fervently. Can't you suggest something when we go down? There's something rather uncanny in this particular amusement. I can't quite shed the delusion that there's somebody in this game who wanted to be in it at all. That was just how I had been feeling, but I didn't say so. But for my part, the worst of my qualms were now gone. The arrival of Mrs. Gorman had dissipated them. We sat on talking, wondering from time to time when the rest of the party would arrive. I don't know how long elapsed before we heard a clatter of feet on the landing and young Reggie's voice shouting, Hello? Hello there. Anybody there? Yes, I answered. Mrs. Gorman with you? Yes. Well, you're a nice pair. You've both forfeited. Where have all been waiting for you for hours? Why? You haven't found Smee yet, I objected. You haven't, you mean? I happen to have been Smee myself. But Smee's here with us, I cried. Yes, agreed Mrs. Gorman. The curtain was stripped aside, and in a moment we were blinking into the eye of Reggie's electric torch. I looked at Mrs. Gorman, and then on my other side. Between me and the wall there was an empty space on the window seat. I stood up at once and wished I hadn't, for I found myself sick and dizzy. There was somebody there, I maintained, because I touched her. So did I, said Mrs. Gorman, in a voice which had lost its steadiness. And I don't see how she could have got up and gone without our knowing it. 
Reggie uttered a queer, shaken laugh. He, too, had had an unpleasant experience that evening. Somebody's been playing the goat, he remarked. Coming down? We were not very popular when we arrived in the drawing room. Reggie rather tactlessly gave out that he had found us sitting on a window seat behind a curtain. I taxed the tall, dark girl with that, having pretended to be Smee, and afterwards slipping away. She denied it, after which we settled down and played other games. Smee was done with for the evening, and I, for one, was glad of it. Some long while later, during an interval, Sangston told me if I wanted a drink, to go into the smoke room and help myself. I went, and he presently followed me. I could see he was rather peeved with me, and the reason came out during the following minute or two. It seemed that, in his opinion, if I must sit out and flirt with Mrs. Gorman, in circumstances which would have been considered highly compromising in his young days, I needn't do it during a round game and keep everybody waiting for us. But there was somebody else there, I protested, somebody pretending to be Smee. I believe it was that tall, dark girl, Miss Ford. Although she denied it, she even whispered her name to me. Sangston stared at me and nearly dropped his glass. Miss who? he shouted. Brenda Ford. She told me her name was. Sangston put down his glass and laid a hand on my shoulder. Look here, old man, he said. I don't mind a joke, but don't let it get too far. We want all the women in the house getting hysterical. Brenda Ford is the name of the girl who broke her neck on the stairs plating hide-and-seek here ten years ago.